So after two days uh, of the scope, we got familiar with uh, high performance computing in general, different polarization techniques. And yesterday, uh, you learned how to, to use uh, efficiently MOX for molecular dynamic simulations, one of the very powerful methods for studying of molecular systems. And today we are continuing to cover two additional areas uh, that are extensively uh, used in uh, biomolecular research. This is free energy calculations and docking. So free energy calculations, uh, you might be familiar, is uh, a powerful method, for example, for scoring drug candidates. And in combination also with uh, docking, they uh, give very powerful uh, tools to researchers. Uh, so first, uh, this morning, we will uh, discuss free energy calculations in use uh, automatically very efficiently. Uh, for example, Gromox is a backend by using the uh, PMX uh, application that uh, you will learn about. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Vitatos Gapsis, who is uh, uh, working at Bio and is the main developer of PMX. He'll tell you more about the method in general and also the, the tool itself. And I will find it very useful in your research work. So, Vitas, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Rosan. And uh, yeah, let me share my screen so we can start right away. Um, now you should see my screen. Let me let me know if, if there's something wrong. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, let, let me then uh, begin with introduction uh, in what uh, we'll cover today uh, overall. Uh, so uh, I decided that uh, it would be probably a good start with a um, more a broader and more general introduction into the free energies. Um, uh, what, what kind of methods we have to uh, with free energies from the, uh, the data uh, and uh, um, why in, in general, why they are of interest. So Rosin already uh, uh, remain applications, but we can also go a little bit into the details. Why, why uh, in what particular questions free energies uh, might be useful to, uh, to calculate. And then um, in the, so this would be my first part of the talk, and later I would uh, show you uh, uh, in the next in the next uh, uh, maybe uh, main applications. So applications we uh, encounter in our everyday uh, work. In uh, so I, I work together with Bert de Grot and the computational uh, biomolecular dynamics group in Max Planck Institute. There we only do computational research, and we always ask questions about protein thermostabilities. We ask questions in ligand binding, and several examples I'll show you <clears throat> today. And then after after the talk, uh, we have also a practical hands-on session. So there, uh, I would um, uh, 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 go even further into the details, uh, and then we really can have a. a look how to set up such calculations and how they can mm, really this pmx and gromax combination can can do some useful things for you <clears throat> all right so let me let me start right away uh, uh, so uh, free energy calculations uh, first firstly let's go to basic question why care about free energies where, where do we find these questions related to free energies so uh, um, uh, the uh, features that already uh, were, were mentioned by uh, Rosen, those are affinities. So, for example, uh, imagine ligand and uh, to a protein. So, a common common question in the drug design field: uh, how uh, how strongly does the ligand uh, bind? The uh, binding itself is uh, uh, synonymous to the free energy difference. So, if we are able to calculate free energy difference, we actually also already have access to uh, to the affinity. In other words, we know how strongly the ligand interacts with the protein. Similarly, to, for protein-protein binding, it's uh, exactly the same um, uh, uh, way of 
Mm, also, stabilities are free energies. Uh, consider a protein folding example. A protein is may prefer to be in its or it's unfolded. So if the, we uh, tilt the free energy into the direction of the folding on of the folded state, we are uh, then uh, make the protein more thermally stable. This, in uh, principle, uh, again, is just a matter uh, of calculating energy difference uh, between the unfolded state. Uh, also, rates. Uh, we we often consider rates as a, a yeah as a kinetic parameter, but if you, you express that. Um, um uh, yeah as a relation a rate is a relation to the uh, uh, has direct relation to the of the free energy barrier between the uh, potentials of mean force for example of uh, how ion crosses uh, a channel or water molecule cross aqua, uh, aquaporin channel um aquaporin protein um it, it also uh, uh, crosses uh, on on some certain landscape and if, if barrier then the crossing will be uh, then the channel will be less conductive if, if there is a lower barrier then the, the it will be more conductive to uh, assess the free of uh, yeah, free energy landscape of this transition so i hope i convinced that uh, free energy calculations are very many many different applications and uh, what methods what flavors do we have for the free energy calculations so yeah uh, this is a very rough sketch so you don't need to um, uh, some some um, attempt at a really uh, fine-grained uh, division of the methods just my rough interpretation so let's let's start from the right side uh, those are uh, um, uh, statistical methods that i uh, separate uh, uh, there in the separate branch statistical meaning that we are not using uh, physical principles or uh, even if we are using them we approximating them uh, CV. Uh, those could be uh, ligand-based and structure-based. So imagine ligand-based uh, um, statistical methods are the ones where we ask, okay, we have now a bunch of ligands. We don't know anything about the uh, what they uh, bind to, what they interact to. We simply try to establish a regression between uh, some descriptors, bands, maybe their number of atoms, number of hydrogen bonds that the ligand has, number of um, rotatable bonds, and and the uh, 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 or free energy. So these would be uh, very chemoinformatics based approaches. Structure based approaches would already take into consideration uh, protein ligand uh, interface and would perform docking into, into these um, binding pockets. Hybrid methods, uh, this is the middle, those are, um, they, they uh, combine both physical, physics based. Uh, for example, sampling approaches, as would be uh, Poisson ball and accessible surface, and then the regression based on these um, sampled uh, sampled uh, <clears throat> quantities, they construct a regression, approximate the free energy uh, uh, differences. Or statistical force field could be used as Rosetta or Foldex, for example, use. They use uh, statistical force fields, which uh, but the local sampling in, uh, in that force field, and this already uh, brings them into some hybrid mm, between statistical and first principles based mm. and first principles based method, methods those are the methods that we'll be using today mm, or, or discussing today and using later uh, so this is the whole zoo expanded there more and those could be free sampling bias sampling then we go into alchemical methods enhanced sampling and uh, uh, we will discuss further into those so let's go branch so uh, be before we just jump in, <clears throat> yeah, we have this popping up. Uh, uh, if, uh, before we pin to them <clears throat> methods, uh, uh, how to extract free energies from the calculations, let's let's uh, re recall a few uh, yeah a few ways to uh, uh, to express um, uh, to express uh, free energy. So the first uh, uh, relation, let's let's have uh, so the first relation. You probably know it very well. It just relates enthalpy and entropy, uh, and the uh, enthalpy minus um, entropy weighted by the temperature, uh, free energy. So this is a thermodynamic description of the free energy. And the, another, let's let's have a look at the uh, how, how uh, from the statistics point of view we can express relate uh, free energy uh, of of a state I. Uh, we can relate it to 
the probability of a, a, a particle or a system being in that microstate I. And uh, now we'll go over approaches that will utilize, give us insight into these both into both of these um, relations, and uh, we'll uh, express the free energy or extract the free energy difference from the. So let's have a look at the first example, and it's very simple example, but it uh, uh, already captures or uh, in uh, uh, the mainly uh, intuitive nature of these relations that I just showed. Uh, so. Imagine we have a peptide, which is able to unfold, and we simply monitor the RMSD from the uh, from some reference state. Uh, and in the top, we are running uh, at uh, 298 Kelvin at the room temperature. We're running it, and we uh, mainly remain below the red line state. Sometimes we uh, transition into the unfolded state, but very rarely. Uh, now. Uh, in the lower panel simulation, uh, now we are uh, running. Uh, sometimes we are still in the folded state, but now almost let's say 50% of the go higher into the unfolded state. So we keep on unfolding much uh, more uh, often. Uh, sorry, I just. Um, and now the, these this these two panels already illustrate very nicely how we can extract the free energy differences. So remember that the free uh, are, uh, well, they are nothing else but the probability, probabilities, probabilities of being in one state, but we simply can count frequency of occurrence of a system in unfolded state versus the folded state and use this relation that I showed statistical mechanics definition ratio of the probabilities will come out to uh, relate to the delta G between the two states. And we immediately can extract the delta G, counting the uh, probability or frequencies. And based on the law of large numbers, we just relate them to probabilities. OK. And another uh, feature, we see the effect of the temperature. We change the temperature. We change. We shifted also the free energy balance to the uh, more to the unfolded state. And we can go back again to the relation happened. So we had our. And we all of a sudden increased the entropy contribution because we just uh, changed the T uh, to a higher temp. If the, the, um, the G in this case, it would be delta G because we uh, considered the two states, the difference between the two states, we shifted it to another. Uh, uh, so we can go even further. So this was just in our MSD space. We can also expand it into the a little bit more into the conformational space density. And notice that they were not just folded and folded, there were several folded states. So the, the, this is just a, a principle dimensionality that uh, uh, you reduce the dimensionality. Every point now represents a different conformation of the peptide. Mm, and we notice that the basins of different, different conformations and all the rest is there unfolded. Let's call that unfolded. Can we extract the free energy differences between those? Con let's continue on. Simply let's count how many points are in each of those. And we can again just let's put a, a, this is a multi three dimensional space, put in uh, some real coordinate, and we can see those three basins populated nicely. The first one is the deepest, and it has the lowest, the most occupied by that. Then there will be the second and the third. And now, if we uh, look at it uh, also uh, color by the temperature, by which at which the simulation is performed, we can see already that uh, this very nice free energy landscape uh, changes substantially the temperature. All of a sudden, that where barriers are no longer barriers, the, uh, it, it, uh, you could consider it to be much, much, much flatter. This, yeah, so uh, this very simple example already shows us uh, all the uh, particular features of uh, how we energy is an added sense and how we can control the transitions between barriers and, uh, just by changing the temperature. Uh, but say sometimes, well, yeah, we know that uh, using temperature as a trick, we can overcome the transition barriers. We can, uh, therefore, uh, you start constructing some replicate based replica exchange schemes and so on. 
but uh, let's let's say we are interested at a free energy landscape at a given uh, given temperature we are faced with a situation where we're, where uh, our particle simply can sample just one side of the barrier the barrier this barrier it's it's quite high and we never cross it so we never observe a transition but we are interested in uh, learning is the uh, landscape is the free energy landscape and what is the difference between the free energy values on one side of the barrier and on the other how or is this so a standard would be uh, umbrella sampling and with an umbrella sampling um, uh, i mean uh, placing an umbrella potential so uh, what practice we take this particle let's let's imagine now that this particle is actually water molecule we restrain um, with a potential at a given position and allow it uh, to sample uh, sample the landscape as as it wishes uh, in if if we are let's say in a completely flat landscape there is no uh, yeah no gradient in any direction it will simply sample this uh, ocean as defined by potential but if there is if it is on a uh, yeah some uh, curved free energy landscape it will uh, slightly tilt it direction or in another uh, it will have a, a simply uh, a little bit preferred direction later we shift them a little bit and do the same uh, now uh, the blue molecule would be in the place of one red molecule then we do the same the same the same sample uh, across the on the reaction coordinate all right uh, now uh, we have sampled uh, the again uh, um, uh, positions of the uh, particle uh, as as it wishes to sample we only need to unbias the the uh, and and we in principle already rely again on our counting just count how often the particle prefers to be in one place to another uh, the, the only trick is that we applied also some bias so we seem but but we know exactly what, how much bias we included because it's simply a harmonic potential and there is a technique called weighted histogram analysis method that allows to remove that potential from the positions uh, uh, yeah from the sampled um, let's say densities and we uh, recover exactly the same uh, potential as we would as the particle would feel when crossing the this free engine landscape all right, so this would be uh, an enhanced sampling uh, sample, uh, but let's uh, let's go further. Let's go one step further. Uh, so let's let's look at, again uh, at the same that we have um, two states of a system and a large a large barrier between the two. Of them. Now we are interested uh, again. The barrier is large enough that uh, we wouldn't cross it uh, just spontaneously, so we cannot obtain free energy differences just just by pure sam but uh, we are also let's let's formulate the question in the following way that we are not interested in the height of the barrier we are just interested in the uh, difference between ga also free energy in the state a and the difference in and state for example it could be binding. so the triangle binds to this pacman and and uh, becomes a bound ligand bound square uh, <clears throat> so now we uh, we could of course do an umbrella sampling but that would be computationally very expensive and difficult to convert the question becomes um, actually somehow let's learn how to transform this triangle into the square is there is there a technique and this is exactly the alchemical so let's go now uh, a little bit into the details of that there are several flavors of the alchemical approaches so here i'm showing so uh, i replace the air now with the um uh, with this ellipse we're uh, our question is can we uh, somehow transform the ellipse triangle and uh, learn what the free energy difference between the two of them is and there is a, a way we simply uh, so ellipse is this hamiltonian uh, so the um, uh, potential uh, uh, of the system uh, uh, which uh, governs the yeah the, the dynamics uh, in in state a and potential of the system in state b all right uh, now we can construct a hypotonian by simply uh, combining two of them with a coupling parameter 
So it could be just, uh, uh, let's say, one minus times Hamiltonian A plus uh, lambda Hamiltonian B. Just a simple linear combination of the two Hamiltonians and uh, control this lambda parameter. Just control it in the simulation. Now, if we uh, very, uh, very, very slowly drag this parameter lambda from one state to another, we can, at every point in time, we can uh, calculate the partial derivative of the of this combined with respect to lambda. This is the, uh, uh, so the derivative of Hamiltonian with respect to a certain parameter is, is a force acting along that, along that, uh, uh, that coordinate. So in this case, force along uh, alchemical lambda parameter. And now if we integrate a force, we get uh, work. In this case, if we do it infinitely slowly, it, um, we the the work we don't we don't dissipate any work it becomes the free energy difference in this case. and this technique is called thermodynamic integration. All right, there, is there another approach? And yes, there is. It uh, it is a different to, to consider exactly the same problem. It's called free energy perturbation. So for free energy perturbation, we consider a system. We can uh, um, simulate the system in state A, don't do any perturbation, uh, nothing so far, in state B. Okay. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> so when we simulated system in A, we extract the coordinates from the state A. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and, and evaluate them with the Hamilton state A. But also we do the oh, excuse me, we do the following trick. We take the same the from state A, play them also with the Hamiltonian of state B. And now uh, there is a relation, the known uh, derived by Zwanzi. It's called free energy perturbation that allows to relate the difference between these two Hamiltonians and the, their average to the difference. We can also do exactly the same with state B. And it should, and should, it should also come out exactly the same pre-engine plate in state B coordinates. Evaluate them with the Hamiltonian of state B, so it's native one, and the foreign Hamiltonian of state. And uh, their difference in the two Hamiltonians, uh, exponentially averaged, will give us pre-engine difference. And does it work? Yes, it will, but only difference between the two uh, Hamiltonians uh, is very small at the order of uh, thermal fluctuations, but usually much larger per, uh, to the system where there is no overlap between the two. So uh, these two points would be very far from one another. But what? But then we can do the trick, simply start putting intermediate states, right? So we don't directly calculate Hamiltonian A and B, we divide into uh, subsections. So Mm, yeah, uh, X, Y, Z, and so on. Small, small uh, perturbations. And we do exactly the same math, exactly mm, also simulation, intermediate values, and collect them into one delta G afterwards. Okay, so this is free energy perturbation. And of course, conceptual differences between T and TI, they both report on the same free energy difference in the end, but they have different uh, strengths and, and weak. Uh, FEP is sensitive. Uh, uh, <clears throat> choice of this exact uh, lambda scheduling, um, uh, uh, lambda stratification, uh, uh, yeah, uh, strat um, while um, TI in principle would be uh, giving a smooth transition, but uh, one has to integrate over over uh, work work value as you can see, and the, or, or DH the lambda <clears throat> curve, and this of course then. Uh, some in also FEP would uh, require some equilibration for each and every window and requires uh, one to be always at equilibrium in each and every window and uh, sufficiently converged. Um, so this can be computationally very expensive. But the uh, TI principle relies, no growth standard TI relies on the fact that uh, the transition is always at equilibrium, but this is an, an assumption, right? Uh, therefore, 
there is some certain, let's say, Hamiltonian lag or always introduced um, work dissipation with this method. Uh, and yeah, we have exponential versus direct calculation for, as I already mentioned, exactly direct calculation that requires some uh, numerical integration then. And we have more a flavor, it's uh, the equilibrium free energy calculations. Let me uh, uh, also uh, highlight those. So you already saw this of, uh, uh, of uh, thermodynamic integration. Okay, so we have uh, we have this uh, um, way to calculate. In this case, you see I with W. Uh, this means that we do no longer do this transition from state A to state B very slowly. So uh, if we don't do the transition from state A, let's say wild type protein to the mutant protein very slowly, when we make a transition, we uh, dissipate work. If we dissipate work, well, we call it simply W. So we calculated some work, but it's fine. Now, what do we do with that work? Let's, let's now have a look uh, at a little bit, a little bit of the concrete example that I'm sketching here. Let's say we have a wild type uh, protein simulation, simulated very long at equilibrium. We didn't do any uh, magic there, and we made very many transitions from one state to its mutant version. And these transitions, we calculated this W with exactly this equation that I'm showing here. And now we got values and built a histogram. This is the blue histogram. Then we do exactly the same, but in the opposite direction. We simulated the mutant state, the transitions into the wild type state. These are the red arrows. The, we also calculate work values and we make a red histogram. Okay, now we have grams and they overlap somewhere. And there is a powerful theorem which is called, uh, derived by Crookes. Crookes. It relates simply uh, probability distribution in the forward direction of work values with the probability distribution in the uh, reverse uh, direction to be a, a difference in at the intersection point. And we can also recover free energy difference this way. Now we dropped the assumption completely require equilibrium during transitions. Of course, the uh, end states, these two uh, ellipses, black ellipses, they need to be at equilibrium, but later we don't be there. Okay. So uh, this was the really theoretical uh, part. And let's go now a little bit, let's go a little bit um, uh, toward, towards the applications. And now you learned uh, a lot about uh, methods that that we applied yet but let's try to bring it uh, um, bring it to the to the concrete example and the example mm, i'm phrasing here is a calculation of thermostability in a protein due to a mutation so we have the following step a protein which can be in two states in this uh, yeah in this thought experiment it can be in its folded state and then in unfolded state. So we learned that we can uh, extract free energy differences by counting. So let's simply simulate infinitely long and uh, uh, how protein sometimes sometimes unfolds. Count how many times it is in the folded state, count how many in unfolded, relate these frequencies of the unfolded to the probabilities, from the probabilities extract the free energy difference. All right, but this, uh, of course, there is a catch that, uh, practically very expensive or feasible because uh, I mentioned that let's do this process infinitely long. So it, 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 will, it will take a while to reach infinitely long sampling, right? And, um, but let's, uh, so let's continue and let's do uh, the next trick. Let's introduce the mutant. So now we have two situations, one wild type situation, and another is a mutant, where mutant is folding, unfolding, folding, unfolding, and we do exactly the same trick. And now we uh, uh, have uh, uh, systems uh, which we need to simulate in infinitely long. So you may ask, well, just do you made uh, uh, intractable problem twice intractable? Uh, all right, true. But now we can uh, 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 that we have also chemical methods. Let's do. Uh, the alchemy. Now, uh, alchemical methods will go in this cycle to draw here. 
here I'm in the cycle, uh, they will uh, be the uh, horizontal arrows that are connecting the two uh, wild type and mutant in respective folded and unfolded states. So what it means is it means that we alchemically, we need to calculate the free energy difference uh, protein in the folded protein and in the unfolded protein. And then from that free energy difference, so we, in one case, delta G, we recover delta delta G. And this delta delta G will keep on using this delta delta G throughout the uh, yeah, practicals and, and the next examples. This means how much the protein folding uh, free energy changes upon mutation. So if uh, delta G is negative, then we know mutation made uh, the protein uh, fold, uh, yeah, strong, fold more, or the folded state stable than, than the unfold with respect to its wild type state. All right, so that's all the magic that we have. Uh, of course, these are uh, more thorough explanations. We still need to uh, uh, build a technical, practical framework for that, for for running these alchemicals. So maybe you are already familiar with running standard pre energy calculations or, or simulations where you can uh, solve the system in a box, add ions, and run the simulation. But now we need to do something a little bit different. We need uh, still to have the same capability of, uh, calc of running the simulation, but now our system needs to represent both states, the blue wild type and the red mutated state as in catch at the same time. And we need to have a control between the two states. And for that, so uh, as a, these simulations, but we need patient for that, we have uh, uh, developed our uh, PMX framework for that, of which I will talk, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, which which I will uh, discuss a little bit more <clears throat> in detail. But I'll mainly go into the examples showing how we can do the, what what we can do with relations, and uh, we'll have a, a real hands on uh, in the next session on uh, to to uh, where I will show happening to the structures when we do this uh, when we do this, these alchemical transitions. What happens to the topologies? Uh, exactly results we in and uh, so on and so forth so we'll uh, uh, now let's have a look what we actually can achieve with, with these alchemistry approaches so um, i divide it roughly into three categories uh, let's have a look at the amino acid mutations nucleotide mutations and ligand modifications i'm changing the system in the questions that we ask here and then uh, and this uh, all can be achieved by um, changing the term thermodynamic that we are constructing. So let the protein mutations and ask, so can we uh, predict accurately how mutations change protein thermostabilities? We took the uh, example of protein very well studied by um, experimentally. Uh, it, uh, it has been all uh, mutated through and through experiment I color the mutated in red. And we simply uh, experimentally, it has been mutated and, uh, bind and the folding uh, free energy difference so we can calculate with those alchemical methods that I showed before exactly the same free energy differences uh, and uh, compare them to the... So this is a classical way compared to the uh, uh, delta, delta Gs. I'll show a few of those plots. So let me briefly describe. Uh, well, the x-axis is a the G. So this free energy difference in the folding free energy upon a mutation uh, me as measured experimentally. Is, is exactly the same, just calculated. So no experimental input, just a calculation. And uh, yeah, you see, as you see, uh, over uh, trend is very, very. There are some outliers, and there are some. Uh, there is some deviation, which is uh, below one kilocalorie per mole, oh, on on average. This is the gold standard in the field. We are always aiming to reach that standard because we know that uh, below that. Uh, average error, it's difficult to, to yeah, uh, force field issues, sampling issues, and also the experimental error. We cannot be exactly, exactly on, on top of the fusion, but uh, this limit where that we are able to reach with our methods. Uh, so we can also change this uh, and, uh, to uh, 
protein binding. I can simply modify thermodynamic cycle a little bit, and all of a sudden I do exactly the same alchemical mutations. But in this case, how how strongly uh, amino acid mutations influence the binding of a um, in this case a chapter to to a major compatibility complex uh, that's exposing a peptide there. So I mutated all of these yellow residues and compared them again to experiment. Uh, we don't need to the details of these studies. I'm merely to bring the examples of how these um, how these uh, calc apply. And again, we reach exactly the same accuracy uh, up below one kilocalorie per mole. Again, so yeah, let's just look at the left left scatter plot. Uh, uh, experiment calculation is a very good trend. Again, several outliers. We know that uh, they, they will occur in our calculations. Uh, and we often alleviate those by sampler or maybe including another force field. But uh, uh, this is a very uh, traditional answer that we expect from our. Now, again, we keep on pushing this further, uh, uh, introducing new questions. And uh, another question could be, could we predict uh, uh, mutation in, in, a, in, a, in a protein could be drug resistant? Uh, so for that, at first we took uh, uh, HIV protease as a canonical. So it's a it's a which is usually a, a, a targeted by uh, drugs uh, in in the yeah uh, patients. Uh, however, that's what makes HIV so so uh, difficult to treat. It mutates. You, you give a, so, uh, some certain cell, uh, and then it, it quickly. There's a few mutations and escapes those. The drugs are no longer effective. But and it's of course interesting. Can we rationalize it? Can we uh, which uh, which why the mutations are making these uh, effect having these effects? Mm, so we this time we again uh, the thermodynamic cycle where we effect of a mutation. So blue versus red. Uh, but in this case, not on the folding as before, but on the so holo versus apple states of the system and we took all the known uh, or major known uh, <clears throat> that are used to treat hiv see that uh, again our experimental versus calculated free energy difference correlates very well uh, we don't have a, a perfect uh, we don't have a perfect let's say so we do have a little bit of an offset but we're very happy because we can distinguish a strong uh, resistance uh, drug binding versus uh, low resistance uh, mutation in the drug binding. So uh, we can already have a strong predictive our approaches. Uh, we even pushed it one step further. Uh, so uh, it is uh, quite intuitive that if the mutations in the active side, so the, the previous mutations that we broke, yeah, if you mutate something in the active side, well, it will clash with the ligand and it will have a uh, direct effect. Mm. It's interesting to probe those red residues <clears throat> that I'm marking here that are far from the ligand. So they don't have any interaction with and still they ha can influence the uh, drug binding. So uh, again, we probed our uh, free energy calculation technique in this uh, uh, correlated to the restriction factor, which is related to the free energy difference. Uh, so to the ligand binding affinity, <clears throat> a, a very good principle. We can again discriminate those uh, that will be drug resistant from those that will be less drug resistant. And the uh, uh, strength of these molecular dynamic simulations is that uh, once we now we have established that we can uh, uh, accurately predict, we actually uh, have also access to the trajectories. And therefore, we can understand the mechanisms of what is happening in the system. So I highlighted now the two residues. Uh, well, let's say this is one residue because it's a uh, uh, homo. And uh, we, we looked closer. So why is this mutation all of a sudden uh, resistant to, uh, to the drugs in HIV? <clears throat> and it appears that this mutation, it's a uh, residue to another hydro, smaller residue mutation, leucine to valine. Uh, what happens there? Once we uh, uh, remove leucine there, 
uh, so we replace the alien, all of a sudden there appears more space in this region of the of the protein. Uh, there is all of a sudden aspartate uh, lysine can move closer to aspartate and form a salt bridge. All right, this happens. All uh, of course the loop on which uh, this lysine uh, sits. Uh, when it shifts the loop, it destabilizes. Uh, is indirectly directly, uh, um, transfers the effect of the mutation of leucine and destabilizes the ligand. All of a sudden, affinity of the ligand uh, and uh, the, the mutation uh, exerts its um, drug resistance. So uh, in, in the end, has <clears throat> a, a very nice, uh, 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 well, maybe a nasty mechanism of HIV, uh, nicely uh, uh, sedated by this uh, by the molecular dynamics simulation. All right, we uh, let, let's move on. So I uh, promise to show also uh, something uh, different uh, in terms of um, what um, biomolecules we can treat. We can also mutate uh, DNA. So we we can ask the following: we uh, identify how uh, uh, DNA nucleotide mutations would affect. DNA protein binding. So again, I'm just moving the thermodynamic cycle, in this case, mutating DNA, and I'm asking, uh, will the mutation uh, make uh, the uh, binding to the uh, uh, DNA and a protein stronger or weaker? So for that, we collected very many uh, DNA protein uh, complexes. To, to uh, the, these are very uh, complexes as well, uh, including the endonucleases and transcription factors, uh, ver various complexes. If we look at the uh, correlation, we get a very similar answer, slightly, slightly worse in quality than uh, for uh, protein mutation. This could be due to the, due to the fact that, um, um, yeah, maybe DNA force fields are not so uh, advanced, uh, not, not so often, and therefore not so refined as protein force fields. And also uh, experimental data was from very wide uh, range of sources. So uh, overall, we still can get a very good predictive accuracy <clears throat> for DNA mutations as well. And we can then further, uh, further questions. Now we have a good method to determine free energy differences. Can we do something what is often done experimentally? So experimentally from, uh, let's say, uh, random binding assays, it is possible to define um, DNA binding profiles. So what people do, they just um, uh, uh, yeah, allow uh, random nucleotides uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in such an assay, bind the uh, ra uh, random DNA C to the protein and count like, um, from their experimental outcome, they count how many times, let's say, I saw adenine in the position, or how many times I saw uh, guanine in the position seven. And from these counts, it is possible then to reconstruct such a low uh, uh, that uh, tells us uh, what exactly nucleotide preferences are for every position uh, when it's bound to the protein. We can, we, uh, these already established, the counts are uh, directly related to the, well, counts are also probabilities of finding some in a given position. And it is, again, nothing else but the free energy difference. So we can, again, re-establish uh, re this connection between the energy differences, which we can calculate the, uh, and, the, and such a uh, probability, uh, probability profile. Here I'm showing uh, several such profiles. And the, just, just by eyeballing, I will explain in a second what they are. You will probably see that there are all have the same key, just have small differences between them in, in, yeah, in, particular. in particular features. They do differ, but they are, uh, uh, <coughs> the, the major features are the same. And uh, now the top profile is the computational scan. It's from our computation. All the uh, one, two, three. These uh, so four bottom rows are um, uh, different experiments. Uh, either it is a SELEX or uh, or a protein binding microarray experiment. Uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here, I, I also have a quantification of this. 
Uh, but uh, just uh, I find intuitive to see that the experiments do have uncertainty, and this uncertainty is uh, makes it uh, the result uh, virtually from the calculation result. So in principle, what we compute, we uh, uh, it falls well within the uncertainty of the experimental um, measurement. All right, and with this we go to the last part for the for the presentation today. Uh, so we also can uh, the, arguably the most lucrative part. We also can do the uh, ligand modifications. Let's say uh, we are asked how uh, what is the difference ligand uh, binding affinity for the red ligand and the blue ligand. We construct the following term, and now we do the same transition just in this case for the ligand binding, not for the amino acid mutation, not for the nucleotide, but for the modification of the ligand. Uh, he, here I'm creating with in a more detailed thermodynamic cycle. We don't need to modify the whole ligand. We can just change one particular substituent. Experimentally, often it is difficult uh, because you may need to um, design a completely different synthesis pathway for those. So it is, it is uh, difficult, uh, expensive also, or maybe not even feasible to to quickly get a, an estimate or so the the, the uh, synthesis of a molecule of the molecules but computationally we can quickly test that and uh, yeah it, it it's been it has a long history because it such an approach would trouble in for the yeah, pharmacy industry because it would uh, immediately have consequences to the and and the lead optimization uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, it has been uh, uh, advertised that this is possible already. Here I'm showing in 1987, so uh, more than thir uh, 30 years ago, uh, where people showed just on, on several uh, molecules that, yeah, it works, it can give accurate answers. With all these flashy high promises, it took, it was maybe just a lucky coincidence and uh, and a long time until the field really really matured to the to the level where it uh, is now uh, applicable with uh, a routine drug discovery pipeline. This is 2015 paper where uh, uh, Schrodinger incorporated the, the company uh, showed that they do have now access to the routine calculations and they provide them, uh, uh, they, they establish this new state of the art uh, calculation pipeline. And uh, yeah, we wanted to, to see if our PMX and Gromax can also reach the same accuracies as this uh, Schrodinger uh, corporation. Uh, and we made our own application by collecting a large number of um, yeah, uh, uh, pharmaceutically relevant protein ligand complexes and uh, com computing, simply computing the, the binding free. And we can compare them directly to the uh, what would we get if we were to use this Schrodinger's uh, uh, expensive commercial so see that we get uh, on the right side it's again uh, as, as usual uh, experimental versus calculated delta delta g's for in this case for ligand binding uh, to the proteins and uh, the in terms of the average uncertain uh, average uh, unsigned error we are again uh, in the very uh, regime identical Correlation we are again with, uh, within a, uh, uh, then uncertainty limits from one uh, between the two methods. You have slightly larger error, and this is mainly because of the methods that we are using to uh, calculate the uncertainty. We uh, simply try not to estimate the uncertainties as we run independent repeats from our calculations. But otherwise, we are able to reach the uh, same factors as the commercial. And we also can do uh, now the, the last two minutes. I just want to show that uh, now I talk about mutating something. So mutating one amino acid to another, mutating nucleotide one to another, or changing a small part of the of the ligand. But we can also, in principle, we can do absolute binding calculation. Let's say we don't want to mutate just or modify just a part of the ligand. We can, in principle, disappear ligand alchemically. This modifying the thermodynamic cycle a little bit and it requires some 
other computation, uh, some other theoretical and uh, computational considerations. But in principle, if we ask the question, can we bind, uh, can we bring this uh, benzene from uh, uh, from solvent, so from water, into the binding site of the protein? It is uh, this transition of binding it is its computation challenging, but we can do it also alchemically. We can disappear the benzene. We can restrain it, so place it into the ink pocket, and then uh, by uh, uh, removing the restraints and taking their contribution into account, a uh, couple system. And we recover exactly the same delta uh, G, but in this case, uh, it's not a relative, but an absolute binding frame. So we, it is also possible. We have probed it in a lar large scale scan. So if I just show, we selected from our previous investigation a subset to have many values to play with. We also can recover a very uh, good agreement with experiment. There is, there are, it's true, there are more of the red points that we saw before, but uh, in principle, the overall accuracy is very, very comparable. So it is also feasible. Just the <clears throat> the the uh, bottom line that I wanted to bring today, and uh, yeah, I would like to thank everyone who was involved in these studies and uh, uh yeah, also uh, other fundings, and uh, I'm ready for for questions. Thank you, Vitas. Uh, I will encourage everyone to write your questions in the chat and. We can take it from there. So we have a question from Eda. How much computational and time are needed for PMX of a protein complex, for instance? Um, uh, I guess right. the question is if you have a complex and you want to calculate the absolute uh, binding energy, it's my interpretation of the question. OK. Let me uh, uh, give a, a bit of an overview. So um, um, now uh, these calculations that I showed, all of using uh, non-equilibrium free energy calculation protocol. So the timings that we would need for that are approximately, uh, let's say, uh, in orders of uh, up to 100 nanoseconds per free energy value in total so uh, uh, irrespectively of the of the uh, question that uh, whether it's protein complex or protein ligand complex where uh, uh, in total it would take uh, let's say 100 nanoseconds or nanoseconds to get uh, the that i reported now uh, uh, um, uh, it, it of uh, uh, results in a different user time needed because uh, the larger systems, if you're interested in protein protein complexes, will simply have many atoms. You will uh, you will have a, a lower lower simply lower nanoseconds per day output for that. Yeah, and uh, but but that's probably another question. Right? Is there a big difference uh, because if you're in a small ligand compared to this uh, much larger molecule from a complex that it will introduce additional in the computation size uh, yeah that, that's a, also a good point so of course the perturbation size also matters we always play in a um, perturbation that are not uh, as small as possible because then we uh, simply retain the system as close to equilibrium as converge quickly uh, of course uh, uh, for the absolute free energy so I, I only touched very very lightly on that but those would be much more so to converge them one needs a uh, 10 times longer sampling than than to converge relative free energies that's why relative free energies are so they are easy to con uh, and the uh, per perturbation sizes of uh, <clears throat> yeah I don't know up to up to atoms uh, should be should be easy to convert mm -hmm. thanks 
So there's a question from Grigor who is asking whether in accuracy compared with MGBSA or MMPVSA. Uh, yeah, certainly. These, these methods, um, alchemical methods, are uh, more accurate. We rely on these assumptions that, uh, uh, that uh, the approximate methods. Uh, also, uh, yeah, we don't have a problem of incorporating or combining, add, adding with the uh, entropic contribution or MMPBSA or GSA. You, you, compute something, you fit the curve, so it's already fitting is involved, and then when you add now a little bit from another method, and yeah, yeah, this Frankenstein, of course, can be fit into a good agreement, but it's uh, by no means robust and rigorous. Hmm. Thanks. For question, do you see difference in performance of the various force fields that you have used in the development? Uh, yeah, that's a very good. Uh, we do see difference uh, with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, probably Amber for uh, uh, the force fields and Charm family force fields are performing uh, best in our experience. Um, uh, maybe PLS is a um, this is a little bit uh, less accurate, but uh, uh, we are always using the non-commercial OPLS version, uh, yeah, publicly available. Uh, and what uh, the, the interesting uh, uh, thing that we've noticed that the force errors usually cancel out. Force fields do make uh, errors, uh, but they are often in different directions or in different parts of the model. Then they uh, <clears throat> Uh, reduce one another. Uh, mainly, I, I could explain this by the fact that different force fields, uh, molecular mechanic for currently have very simpli simplified uh, um, uh, forms. So there is only fit with su with such with such high, uh, highly restrained functional forms. Uh, and uh, if, for example, Amber is trying to uh, the uh, optimally the uh, electrostatic potential surface representation of small molecules. At the same time, Charm is not trying that. Trying to optimize uh, the the interaction with water uh, for small molecules uh, and coordination with with the water. These two may not be uh, necessarily com compatible in one single force field, but if you were uh, to simulate to obtain results with two different force fields. Uh, have a much more accurate representation of what's overall happening in the system if you're if you're simply able to find a consensus of both of them. It's difficult to say how to find this consensus, but for free energies, it's very trivial. In principle, free just a value, so you get one value from amber, another value delta G from charm, and we notice that uh, these two force fields are very well compatible. Simply calculate average of those. This will be always at least as accurate as the uh, more accurate force field alone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have another question regarding outliers. So, in the examples that you were showing, there were outliers, but do you that uh, people validate or benchmark results for every new application that they do? Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, it's it's always uh, very good to uh, uh, very good to have some uh, experiment data on a system or a similar system to compare it to before starting to make predictions. So it, there could be, of course, with either with a force field or with a <clears throat> with a particular setup. Uh, for example, uh, I, just from the personal experience, it's always an issue if there are additional factors involved, simply the accuracy drops significantly. So, but if you have a, 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 a handful of data to compare, uh, it, it's always good uh, good practice to establish the relation. So what will you expect from your prediction?
Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I don't see any more questions in the chat. And now it's 10.30 Central European. So I suggest we take now the half an hour break before we continue with the uh, practical demonstration at uh, 11 o'clock Central European time. So thanks everyone. Uh, we'll have a break and we'll come back again in 30 minutes. <laughs>